Maybe we should start with that. We've never really talked about that. Um, um, <laughs> Father well, Larkin. Father well, I, Larkin. Have the, I have the privilege of my first day in St. Peter's was Father Larkin's first day. And it was his first class. And he looked, I could see the class in absolute terror. And uh, he said, right, we'll uh, do a Wonderful, wonderful. Things are brightening <laughs> amazingly. Um, <laughs> Cheers, Colin. Um, sorry, Paul. Cheers, sorry. I'm rather talented. So anyway, he said, we'll, we'll, we'll do a... We'll, we'll look at Keats's Ode to Nightingale. And he said, uh, I want somebody to read, to read, read, read it. And he caught my eye. Something happened. He said, you, you, you stand up and read. So I knew Keats's Ode to Nightingale off by heart. <laughs> at what age? Oh, I don't know, 13, 14. What? 13, 14? 13, 14. You knew it uh, off by heart? Yeah. I can still do most of it. Um, so, of course, <laughs> he, he was horrified because here was somebody who, you know, he could see me not even looking at the book. And I'm <laughs> thinking, Christ Almighty, are they all going to be like this? <laughs> uh, so after about five nights, he said, right, 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 sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. And uh, we got on wonderfully well after that. He was a good man. Um, at St. Peter's, there were day boys, but there were mainly boarders. So I was a boarder. And the day boys were very important because they could get you cigarettes <laughs> and they could post letters and do messages generally. But there were very few, actually, boys from Wexford um, town in the school. Well, my friend, Billy Kelly, uh, one year he started up a bookmaking uh, business among the boarders. <laughs> And uh, he made enough to take himself and his father to the Grand National and wherever it is, Liverpool or whatever. Uh, yeah, he, he made a lot. But I remember I used to call from, because we were day boys, we would have to come back to study at uh, five, five to seven, I think, you know, from five to seven. And I would collect, collect him. And I arrived in one day and he said, sit down, sit down, sit down. I said, stop, stop, I'm watching this. And he said, I've taken a bet on a triple, you know, three horse thing. So if one horse wins, the money, the winning, that goes on the next one, and that goes on to the next one. He said, this is the third one, the first two won. He said, if this one wins, I'll have to leave the country. Because yeah. <laughs> I owe the guy hundreds of pounds. So we sat there bare knuckled, the third one lost. Oh. Uh, but he was uh, quite a nerve, we had great fun. Um, I asked Father Larkin about you once. Did you? <laughs> and he, he told me that the, that the style, elements of the famous style that became your signature style were there from very early on and the handwriting from very early on was, was, a, was that you had a beautiful handwriting and that you had a, a fully formed, or he thought, a fully formed style aged 14, 15. And he still has, um, I think, some of your notebooks or essays from that time. Is that true about your style and your handwriting? Well, I mean, how, how do I know? But yes, I mean, I, I was writing from the age of about 12, 13. I mean, my sister gave me a copy of Joyce's Dubliners when I was, I guess, 12. And I was just I was bowled over by this because here was writing that was about life as I knew it. You know, it wasn't a Wild West yarn or a detective story or a thing about pub English public school boys getting up to japes and so on. Uh, this, is, this is real life. Uh, and I was immediately galvanized. And I <laughs> my Aunt Sadie, who lived down the road, and you know, everybody has an Aunt Sadie who lives down the road. And she had a Remington uh, typewriter, which was as big as a tractor, and uh, made almost as much noise. And I used to go down to her on Saturday afternoons, and sometimes when I was coming back from school, and I would bash out dreadful imitations of Joyce's Dublin. I mean, really dreadful, embarrassing even to think about it now. Um, so I kept at that for, you know, plugged away at that till I was 17 or 18, and then I wrote a story called The Party, which is not very good, but when I'd finished it, it was not, didn't belong to me anymore, it drifted free. I felt like I'd given birth to a baby that was now something else in the world. 
And it was that moment I knew I, I, I could be a writer because, uh, you know, up to then everything was, was, was me. Suddenly I realized that, that writing is not about me at all. It's, it's making something and putting it into the world. I don't know if you'd agree. Yeah. I, I've, I'm interested in the Dubliners thing because um, there, there's a sly joke. Uh, um, the first sentence of um, The Dead is Lily, the caretaker's daughter, was literally run off her feet. And the first sentence here at one of the sections is Helen, the woman of the house, was literally run off her feet. And then, of course, you start, well, literally, not literally, no. You know, in other words, you, so, uh, I mean, there... No, I had a lot of fun in this book of poking fun at uh, my, my great predecessors uh, and paying homage to them. I mean, you know as well as I the, the difficulty for our generation of Irish writers and even for the last generation, previous generation, was that, you know, there were these giants standing behind them. You know, we don't seem to have a tradition of middle brow fiction. You know, it's, it's all... We, we aim either for greatness or we don't do it at all. So, you know, we have standing behind us everybody from Swift up to, up to, to Beckett and Yeats. And uh, I always compare them to Easter Island statues looming over us, <coughs> saying, look at me and look at you, little man. What are you going to do? So it was, I mean, it was, you know, it, I, I found it quite a challenge. I mean, I still do. Uh, and we we found various ways of coping with it. I mean, Neil Jordan went into the movies, although I still think of Neil as a, as a novelist. Uh, he's written a wonderful novel that's coming out this year. Um, but we were all trying to escape that that enormous tradition that we had behind us. Uh, I mean, it was it was a sustenance as well, I suppose. Uh, and you know, we went to England and we saw that. You know, I don't know about you, but every time I'm in England, I have the feeling that the English are just about, you know, keeping themselves from laughing. Uh, you know, particularly if I say, you know, yes, I'll have a banana, please. And they say, oh, oh banana, yes. Um, uh, but, you know, we're able to say, well, yeah, look what we did with the language that you imposed on us. Um, you mentioned Yeats. Uh, this book, I suppose, has a shadow, which is a Yeats poem at the end of his life called The Circus Animal's Desertion, um, where Yeats starts to think about the actual characters he created in his poems and in his plays and takes us through them. And they, they all come alive for him as figures. And so, so the, as though they're not flickering shadows, which they began as, but as actual living creatures that he can bring out on the stage. So the, this book is, is in some way a sort of version of that. Well, an early title for that, uh, was the circus animals. Really? Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, what a good question that was. <laughs> how, how, how delightful. Yeah. I, you, you, haven't just, you haven't just made that up? No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> it started out as dark matter, but then there were so many things were called dark matter. It became such a cliche that I gave it up. And then I thought the circus animals. But then I hit on this really catchy title, Singularity. So my publishers were just thrilled. But actually, you know, I couldn't get a publisher for that book in England. That's not published in England. So th this, is, this is the American no. edition? Wow. Which I think says more about the state of post-Brexit publishing in yeah. England than about my book. Yeah. That's what I like to think, anyway. Um, <laughs> I mean, it sold very little. I didn't expect it. I, if somebody had said to me, you know, a guy... Somehow he knew. He said, you know, it didn't, it didn't sell very much. And I said, I would have been horrified if it sold a lot. <laughs> and I would. Yeah. Uh, a book like this, if it lives, will have a long life. And it will, be, it will need to be read in after times. It's not a book for now. Um, um, yeah. Let's just, I mean, we could go on for really all the time just about the first paragraph. At least I could go on about it. It would be better if you did. Um, just, just start with the beginning. Yes, he has come to the end of his sentence. And, of course, that is um, beautifully ambiguous in that, you know, the end of the sentence, the, his jail sentence, the sentence. Did you say that you, you, you like the sentence? The, you admire the idea of the sentence in language? Oh, for me, yes. I mean, that's my, 
that's my monad. That's that's how I work. I work by the sentence. Um, I mean, I used to write my first novel. I think I wrote nine versions of it. My poor wife, who was working at the time to support me, she would put her head in it. <laughs> She'd come back and work with her head and say, how is the patient today? <laughs> I would say, oh, not well, not well at all. Uh, but now I, I, I work at every sentence and I try to get as close to what I want it to be as I can. Of course, I never, never, get, never get it entirely what I want it to be, but yeah, I work by the sentence. I find that the sentences, I mean, I said in, I've said many times in public, that I think the sentence is the greatest invention of mankind. Um, there have been great civilizations that didn't have the wheel, but they had to have the sentence or they wouldn't have been great and there wouldn't have been a civilization. We do everything in language, in the sentence. We declare war, we declare love. We write our wills in sentences. Um, our laws are, as, as a pastor, our laws are graven in, in the sentence. So, yes, it is. So, so, thing we have. so you start with, yes, he has come to the end of his sentence, and you end with, um, I won't read the whole sentence, but it includes the, the last words of the book are an infinitely full comma stop. Yeah, and so the so the book has a slide joke about its own shape. It begins with a with a, you know with. A well, this I mean, I intended this to be my last book of its kind. I would go on writing crime fiction. A friend of mine said, "Oh yeah, you're going to gentrify crime fiction." Right? Um, which might be a bad idea. <laughs> um, and um, but uh, this was going to be the last one. Yeah. I mean, uh, full stop meant full stop. I, I think it was. Um, Philip Larkin, the English poet, was quoting Oscar Wilde in order to justify Philip Larkin's feeling that his own work from, I think his own second book to the, to the end of his, his career as a poet hadn't developed really, that he said um, that Oscar, I don't think Oscar Wilde said it, but that only mediocrities develop. <laughs> and, uh, it's a great one, one because I, one. I, I came to the, I'm still on the first paragraph. Uh, I come to the first paragraph <laughs> and I find a sentence which, um, 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 Words are all that remain to hold the dark at bay. There's a comma in the middle. Words are all that remain, comma, to hold the dark at bay. And I went and looked and I found 1971, second last paragraph of a novel called Night Spawn. And just that paragraph ends with the words, I love words and I hate death. And I think it says that is, that is all. That it's is very pretentious in those sense, even more pretentious than I am now. <laughs> If you can, if you can but, believe but, that. But, I mean, there we are with the same, with this, yeah. you know, with the same idea. Yeah, well, this was, I mean, th this is a kind of compendium of all my, all my work. Um, it was difficult for me because I can't bear to read my own work. I can't bear to go back. Um, but I, I, I did revisit, I think, all of them. Did you, did you, uh, I, I can't find actual quotes from sentences from the film. Oh, there are quotes. Yeah. Are there? Yeah, there's a quote, I mean, I found... there's, a quote, there's a direct quote from Birchwood in that where he says, um, he says something about time. He says, what are the eternal verities against which I measure these temporal aberrations? That's a direct quote. Oh, is it okay? Yeah. But I mean, I mean, I found the characters, the Cleves, the um, Godwins, Prospero, the Lawlesses, the Bander, um, Gabriel Swan. You know, that, I mean, the fun part is that, that if you've been reading John Bamble's fiction, as I have for the last 50 years, this book is a particular pleasure because you get, oh my God, look who's just arrived. Prospero are the, are the twins. Um, or the circus. And um, so they've all, in a way, uh, been let out of prison. They have. But I would like to say that, you know, you don't have to have read all those other books. I mean, you know, you, 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 if you have read other ones, there's a slight spark that you think, yeah, yeah I remember those previous ones. But I like to think that it's self-contained. Um, it's funny. Um, from the beginning as well, there's always been a feeling that you're fascinated by the idea that something is not quite real in the room and that your efforts to describe it in words make it even less so than looking at it. And um, it, this idea of the uncanny, of the, of the coming into a space or being with someone and just feeling for a second there's something not entirely here in the here. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, I... I I, I find the world and life and myself utterly uncanny. Uh, you know, the German word is one of an unheimlich, which means sort of unhoused, 
I've always felt that. I always feel like a slug, a snail that's lost its shell and I'm exposed to the, to the world. It's, I'm not complaining. This is a wonderful way to be. Um, there's only one little passage in my, you know, my books where I speak in my own voice. I mean, I speak in my voice. Uh, and that's in, I think it's a book of evidence where a character says, I've never got used to being on this earth. I think our presence here is a cosmic blunder. And then he speculates. He says, I wonder how, uh, how the people who are meant for this planet, how they're getting on. And the one on the other side of the universe, where we were supposed to be, he says, I don't know. They would have become extinct long ago, these gentle earthlings, for how would they have survived in a place made to contain us? I, that's true. I think we are uh, the most terrible and the most successful virus this planet has ever known. Uh, and one day, probably soon, Mother Nature may decide, no, this can't go on. Um, I did have high hopes for COVID, but it disappointed me. <laughs> but this avian flu is on the way, so... Uh, um, but... Uh, but I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm, of course I'm joking, but, you know, I'm not an anti-humanist, but I'm a post-humanist. I don't regard human beings as the center of the universe or even the center of this world. To me, people are figures in a landscape and their surroundings are just as important to me as the people. So, now, this drives many of my readers absolutely crazy. One of them said to me one day, why are you always talking about the fucking weather, you know? I said, but we live in the weather. This is, this is literally, we, we swim in it where fishes swim in the sea. This is our element. Why wouldn't I talk about it? And also I think we're influenced far more than we realize by the atmospherics around us. Um, I mean, on the other hand, <laughs> nothing is more boring than talking about the weather. That was another good thing about COVID. For about nine months, people stopped talking about the bloody weather. <laughs> Could talk about COVID. <laughs> Have you had your shot yet? Yeah? <laughs> um, Does any of this make sense? Yes, yes, no, it's just great. But I, I suppose the, the the point is that if you think with that sort of certainty about ideas of, say, reality or ideas of why we're on the earth, and and you also see it, your own opinions as a sort of slide joke. You then, when you're writing paragraphs or sentences, it can come up with something in between that gives you a sort of odd energy, which often happens at the end of sections of this book. I mean, this one, for example, which I think is particularly beautiful. A sigh, a breeze, the faintest stirring, then all still again, as if the all is ever still. And that lovely business of trying to be accurate, trying to move in on something. There. I see the scene enclosed in a vessel of most fragile glass, my busy little creatures, your characters, confined in a flask with a curved and intricate image of the kitchen window reflected in miniature on its rounded cheek. So that's the next paragraph, just a few words. Someone must watch, it has said. Someone must be there. Someone. So in other words, here you are arguing stolen, with yourself. But that's stolen from Kafka. That's stolen from Kafka. Which? Someone must be there. Someone must watch. Directly? Yeah, he, he, I'll tell you exactly what it's from. It's from one of the letters to uh, uh, Felice. And they spent a weekend together uh, at last. He's, he's finally consented to go to bed with her. I think it was great disappointment all around. Uh, and she's left the hotel and he's sitting in her place where she used to sit when they would have dinner. He said, I'm sitting in your in your place at, in, uh, on the balcony where we used to have dinner. And he said, I'm here. Someone must be here. Someone must be there. Someone must watch. Which is one of the most beautiful things. Yeah, yeah. And it's Kafka a, was that. But it's in a different context here, isn't it? I mean, you're, well, of course. You, it seems to but me that's, that's the point. About when you take things out of context, you move them into new context, yeah. they take on a new resonance. It's like touching a spider web, you know, the whole thing shakes. And the big spider comes out. <laughs> um, Speaking of spiders, there, there's a lot about flies and spiders in this book um, that it, it gives you, I think, a way of... What do you tell me? I mean, it gives you a way of 
describing, sorry, look at those tiny busy flies ab above that miniature bay tree's neatly barbered globe. What is it they're weaving, weaving? Well, I do. I mean, I, I think fly is most, one of the most beautiful insects, one of the most beautiful creatures. I mean, if you look closely at a blue bottle, it's the most exquisite thing. Um, its colors are, are uh, you know, we think of flies as black. They're not black. They're iris iridescent, uh, opalescent. Uh, their wings are astonishing. And they're always so busy. They're like drug people in town. I was in town the other day. And drug people are always, they're always in a hurry somewhere. And so are flies. And they're always washing their faces. Uh, and they're wonderful creatures. And spiders are astonishing things. Have you ever seen a spider standing on a leaf and throwing that line of silk across to another leaf? It is an astonishing phenomenon. Absolutely astonishing. Um, one of the most amazing feats in the world, this little thing with all this stuff in its belly and it pulls out a thing and goes, and then it begins to build a web. I mean, we live in a world of wonders. It's only because we got used to it that we're not standing. And I do think that this is the job of the artist, and I know you do too, to stand in a trance of amazement before this world, this strange place that we're thrown into. Your concern is more people than mine. Uh, I'm coming to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, all shall return down to the moonlight between the trees, the spider at its web. Or um, a, that's shiny, a that's, shiny... Sorry? That's Nietzsche. That's from Nietzsche. Oh, come on, give me a break. <laughs> friend of mine... Oh, friend come on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Did you write any did, did Nietzsche actually... Um, all shall return down to the moonlight between the trees, the spider at its web. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my Lord. <laughs> okay, can I... <laughs> he, he didn't write... Who wrote Deirdre? I'm reading the ne next sentence at random, okay? Deirdre speaks. No? No, no, of no, course not. <laughs> <laughs> it, wasn't, um, it wasn't a Deirdre. Person. But I, I, mean, I suppose your interest um, in this idea of finding something that disgusts other people, such as flies, or indeed fascinates people, but only mildly, such as spiders, it, it is a way out of a dilemma which has to do with that you're not interested, really, in psychology. Oh, no. I mean, one of my mottos is from Kafka, never again psychology. Uh, no, I don't, I, I don't. All we know of people is the surface of them. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm an anti-Freudian. Um, we, we, we can't know other people. You know, you're, you live with a person for 50 years, and she or he will turn and say something. And you think, what? I don't know this person at all. It doesn't have to be something momentous, just some small remark. My wife, shortly before she died, she, I said to her, uh, we are talking about something about the afterlife. I said, but we don't believe in the afterlife, do we? And she said, well, I don't know. I thought, my God, I thought we've agreed on that for the past 50 years. <laughs> and it wasn't because she was dying. I mean, she wasn't afraid of dying at all. Um, it was just that, here it was decided that I didn't know anything about it. And all human beings are like that. Uh, I mean, I, I know what you mean. I'm not interested in what they do. I'm interested in what they are. Because, you see, you, you're caught up in this dilemma, just as all novelists are, that we have to deal with a species which lives in a constant state of self-delusion, of self-deceit. In order to live, we have to lie. You know, we have, for instance, we have to tell ourselves, <laughs> I won't die. Um, Hemingway is supposed to have said, you know, how can we live knowing we shall die? And it is an extraordinary thing. I mean, you, we're sitting here, and in 50 years, all was, well, let's make it 75. <laughs> we'll, all, we'll all be gone. Mm. Um, and there'll be new people here, uh, you know, perhaps doing the same thing. This is Again, an extraordinary thing. So we have to, but how are we to write about people who are constantly deluding themselves? How are we to find the truth? How is it to strike through that to some essential truth? That's very difficult indeed. Uh, probably impossible, but it's fun trying. And I, I suppose it, 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 the idea gives you energy, how little we know, because the, you are fascinated by ideas of chaos and, and also by ideas of order. You're fascinated by chance, but you're also fascinated by 
how a pattern emerges. I mean, these things interest you not uh, as a way, I suppose. It, as a novelist, you have to dramatize something. Is that true? You have to what? Dramatize something. Oh, yes, of course. What? This book is full of drama. <laughs> one, of the, one of the moments of um, Emma drama um, occurs on page 85, and um, it, it's, um, it's just great stuff where you, you're, you're talking about, um, just say, that evening. So once you, once you ever start a paragraph that evening in, in a novel by you, you know there's trouble coming, you know, <laughs> that evening. But, you know, if Dickens writes that evening, that evening, you know, that evening, still jittery from travel fever and late on this success, successful outcome of our dealings, the pair of us went on the town together. Watch the cliche. If there's a cliche like went on the town, it's going to cause trouble. Uh, went on the town together, seeking what diversions we might in the Grote uh, um, Affel, as the ruddy-cheeked Dutchman cheerfully but unimaginatively called the conquered city. We had booze, broads, a barroom fight, and a night in the cells. Uh, what booze? But... And in the morning, a crapulous and shamefaced court appearance, followed by summary deportation and a thunderous warning never to show our faces in this town again. No, of course we didn't. Honestly, you'd believe anything. <laughs> you wrote that. And that's not Nietzsche. <laughs> no, no, that's not Nietzsche. That's not Nietzsche. No, I love, I mean, I've always loved, and we've talked about this before, mm. you and I, uh, and I think it's true of every novelist, we're fascinated by the relation between the book and the reader. You know, you can put anything into a novel and the reader will believe it. Uh, and I mean, I'm a reader, you know, I, I, you can read science fiction and you believe it. Um, I've just read a novel by Mary Morrissey, it's a wonderful novel which the premise of it is that when Joyce and Nora Barnacle went to Trieste, Joyce left Nora Barnacle at the railway station. He went off to see about a job and he got into a fight and got put in jail and he left her there. And the premise of this is that what if she didn't stay? And she goes off and has another life. It's a wonderful book. Right. It's wonderful book. Coming out in September. Uh, I think it's kind of masterpiece. I read they, it once and I have to read yeah. it again. They, they, they have a wind in Trieste called La Bora. And I know this because you, uh, you go into a shop and you forget to close the door in full as you went in and they all shout, La Bora! Meaning yeah, shut the door or La Bora is going to come in. It comes down from the Alps and sort of twists around. And Nora, he, he didn't just leave her, he left her in La Bora, yeah. which, which went around her. But... Um, um, I got, how did I get onto that? Oh, we were talking about... Um, oh, making, yes, making yes. fiction. Yes. Fiction is an extraordinary thing. I mean, it's... And, you know, it's so powerful. You can, you can get yourself lost in Madame Bovary or, or Ulysses. Or, and you sit down to have dinner with your, your, your partner. And, you, you know, for about 10 minutes, Madame Bovary and Leopold Bloom, Molly Bloom, are more real than the person sitting opposite you. It's a very strange phenomenon. Uh, and they're just they're made out of words. They're not, they have no existence. I mean, they have no physical existence. They don't, they haven't even got a metaphysical existence. They, they just, they're just words, words, words. And, uh, and I don't know about you, but I always despise writers who say, no, the characters took over. And then, <laughs> <laughs> I always assume they're either fools or they're lying. Because um, the characters don't take over, you know? We, we're, as Richard Ford said recently, somebody asked him that question. I was doing a gig with him somewhere. And he said, uh, you know, oh, they're, they're marionettes. We you know, take off the strings and put them in the box and put them in the attic. You know, and, you know, they're gone. And that's, that's, but yet they have, you know, your Thomas Mann, uh, uh, um, your woman in, in, in Brooklyn. I mean, these people are, they have an extraordinary vividness that is inexplicable because it's just that it's black marks in a white space you know that, and you know people talk about re reading and you know one should read you know, great literature I don't care what people read reading the back of a cornflakes packet is still that extraordinary thing of turning these marks into ideas vistas images no, it's an extraordinary thing. I mean, it's almost as extraordinary as music. If you say that, uh, that a writer puts a flag up 
over a place or a sensibility or some aspect of the self or some that that in your case it isn't as in the case of so many say Irish writers or even other writers of putting a flag up over a very specific place but it's over the imagination itself over the whole procedures of how sentences are made how fiction is made but there's an extraordinary passage in this book where you bring all your characters or you bring some of them to Ross Lair Oh, yeah. And it's so emphatically Ross Lair. Mm -hmm. He's putting a flag up finally over Ross Lair. Yeah. The great Ross Lair writer, John Banville. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, I mean, it really is for anyone who knows that main, you know, it's not a street, but it goes parallel to the coast where these little houses are. And um, It's called Valley Less. Yeah, Valley Less. And, and the Strand Hotel and the Cedars. And yeah. could, you just, could you just talk to us about, about oh, A, well, the I mean, place, and B, the impulse to make it? Well, I'm trying to understand. I mean, Baudelaire said that you know, genius with a small dream consists in being able to summon childhood at will. And I think this is true. Our, not our material, but our, the space out of which it work is childhood, um, is the past. Uh, it sustains us. And a friend of mine, every time I publish a book, he says, I suppose you've gone back to Wexford, have you? <laughs> I said, well... Mm, yeah. And I return again and again, imaginatively, to that, that strange Garden of Eden from which I exiled myself. <laughs> um, but yes, I mean, I, I do think that, that childhood is... The, because, you see, let me put it this way. There's a wonderful line in Wallace Stevens' his North Story of Fiction where he says you have... I can't, you must look at the sun again and look at it with an innocent eye. And that's what we do as writers. We look at the world with a completely innocent eye. We say, isn't this just amazing? I don't understand this. Uh, I'm going to try to give an account of it to myself. And not just trying to find a meaning, because there is no meaning, thank God. Uh, I just I give an account of it. And, you know, you and I, at the end of our lives, we will have, what we will have left is witness. Almost in that Christian sense, we, we will have borne witness to what we saw. This is one human being who lived through this extraordinary uh, predicament, and we left a, a record of it. A record of, of our... Uh, our effort to grasp it, to, 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 as I said, to give an account of it. That comes um, in flashes in, in your books. I mean, in, in a novel like The Book of Evidence, there's, there's a moment where a, where a lorry at night comes by and you can, anyone who's ever been in a bedroom trying to sleep where through the curtains the light of a car comes, coming up first and then going down the wall slowly in a sort of square and then going again. It, and, and it comes up a number of times, that sort of way of describing something. For example, I, I've never read, it's, it's a funny idea, a description of reversing a car in a book, in a novel. I mean, we, we all do it, at least I do it very badly. I did it once for the test and I never relearned. learned, but um, she kept one hand on the wheel, placed the other on the back of her seat half turned and peered over her shoulder and reversed the car in a wide, swift sweep, like a dressage rider backing a thoroughbred into, in, into its stable. You know, the whole business just... <laughs> uh, the, they're, they're, they're really um, these particular passages where you notice something in the world and then describe it as though it has not been described before or noticed very much before are, are, are absolutely brilliant in the book. There's a description of flesh all of us, I suppose, have thought about flesh because we sort of have it. But um, then underneath our clothes, there is our skin. The largest of the human organs, for yes, an organ it is. Skin, for him, is a subject of the deepest fascination. How do we not marvel at it endlessly, this sturdy, pliant sheath that holds in our inside so discreetly, and for the most part with such efficiency, preserving our modesty and shielding from common view the inner fester? 
And then oh, underneath this, there's dark laughter. I mean, forget dark matter for the moment, but dark laughter, I think. I'm hearing a comic undertone of the whole idea of this, this skin and covering. Yeah. There's a nice paragraph in it too about scabs. Remember <laughs> scabs? Scabs? Do you remember scabs? Yeah. Let me... We, we don't we have them as much, get, do we? Children don't play anymore, so they don't get scabs. We used yeah. to get constantly... Yeah, scabs on your And knees. the scab would have to ripen to a certain point when you, you picked it off, you know. And it would... Uh, it, if it wasn't ripe, it would, you'd get a slight... You'd say, OK, leave it till tomorrow. And then you picked it off. It's a beautiful thing. I mean, beautiful. Like a little ruby, essentially. And underneath it, there was this incredibly fresh, perfect... Skin, you know, we never saw skin like that except under scabs. Um, and on the subject of chairs, which I, I, I noticed there's some here. Um, <laughs> if you've ever thought about a chair, is well, a life a chair is forced to lead. Um, look at it, crouched down there all day on all fours, as if paying obeisance and in constant awareness of the inevitability of being sat on at any moment by any bottom, lean or fat. Clean or us, clean or otherwise. Now that's clean or otherwise. That thinks to stop and plonk itself unceremoniously down. There should be a ritual to be performed before one sits. A little courtesy, a little curtsy, say, or some sort of art of, of arsy versy genuflection. We owe it to those long-suffering beasts of burden who bear us up with nary a protest, save an occasional squeak or once in a way, a rare way. A collapse. Now you're really enjoying yourself here. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. I, I mean, <laughs> well, if it was going to be the last one, then <laughs> I better have a good time when I'm doing. Yeah, I did. But also, you know, one of the things about uh, that I didn't expect about being old is that it, there's, it's a comic condition. I don't just mean forgetting what you went upstairs to get and so on. There's something comic about the dissolution of the self. The uh, my wife and I used to talk about this. Um, the, the falling apart uh, of the, the self, that, you know, when we were home, we, we got into our 20s finally, we got past all that adolescent horror and so on. And suddenly we were, we were these beings, you know, these invincible beings. And then you get to your middle age, and, then, and middle age is over and like that, and then suddenly you're old. I mean, yesterday I was 37, today I'm 77. And the, there is a, uh, I said, it is funny, you know, it is, it is, you know, be comforted, the young. Uh, it does get, at least it gets funny for me, I, I, I find it, I find myself hilarious. Um, you know, I find myself stumbling around and, um, I particularly found it hilarious that people help me. If, you know, if I'm getting up out of a chair, I always find it in the arm under my head. <laughs> I always say, get away, what are you doing? Get away from me. Uh, but they mean well, of course, because, you, know, I, I, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm old. But I remember Stravinsky saying that uh, when, when uh, uh, <laughs> he, he was crossing the road when he was ancient, he was 90-something, and he said, you could see people looking at him and thinking, I better get a look at him because I won't see him again. You know, he'll be gone. And, that, and you know, there's a comedy to it. Yeah. And this, this book is suffused with, even though there aren't, there's only one old woman in that, but it's suffused with the comedy of, of, of our falling apart. Because, you, know, you know, as I said, we go up from adolescence through, through our glorious 20s and even more glorious 30s. And then... You know, like the trees outside that will be beautiful for another three weeks, and then they start become slightly engrayed. Uh, that starts. We don't even notice it in the forties, but then, as I say, it's a total collapse from there. You know, from your point. From, I remember having you know, a friend of mine, uh, Killian Murphy, actually, the actor. I'm very fond of. Um, I won't be needing this, so... Um, oh, uh, <laughs> sorry, am I talking too much? No, you're great. You're absolutely great. Uh, anyway, I said... That's what we need to hear. I was having lunch with him on his 40th birthday, and I said, Killian, I said, in the 
words have numbered each other. Live all you can. It's a mistake not to. It's, the train only stops at the station once. I said, do that lousy film that will pay you $2 million. You know, have that affair. You know, make a fool of yourself because before you know it, you'll be 70. And didn't you find that? that, that, that you, well, of course, you're not 70. I, I, but I soon will. I mean, I mean, I mean, But the yeah. journey from 40 to... I mean, it, you know, it was a long uphill climb before that. And then you get to the top, you're sort of 45 or so, and then whoop, it's total... The clown, the clown's floppy trousers, floppy trousers um, trips him up. You just tumble down the, side, the other side. I always feel if you have all your hair, that it's, you know... I think to do with hair. <laughs> <laughs> it's so ironic. You always say this, you know. And I can't you see have the, all your hair. Look I at you. cannot see the point of having hair. <laughs> I would love to be bald. I really would. Okay, well, we do a transplant. Oh, yeah. I, uh, uh, no, no, hold, hold on. I, I, I need to go back to Sunday because you got me on that Kafka because um, I wasn't ready for it. I didn't know there was Kafka wrote that. I, I think, and also, I'm still, would you? I still don't trust you on it. But, how but would you? I don't trust you on the Kafka. But you did, you, you did move something that he was writing about domestically, you know, someone, someone into yeah. some other realm, which is almost metaphysical. I mean, suggesting someone, someone. And I, I'm, I'm interested in that because. Um, at the end of part one, you, you, you actually start, I mean, this is, um, this is pretty beautiful. And I summon up the others, all the success of others who will be hereafter and gone, and for whom the air will pipe again, perhaps like this, of an evening in the fading light. And I say to myself that despite everything, even on such inconsiderable evidence, it cannot, be all, it cannot all be for nothing. So I'm taking that in the same context as, as, as the set, those sentences about someone. And I'm asking you if, I mean, well, could you just comment on that maybe would be the best question. Well, I, maybe the best way to do it is to quote a little bit from Wilkins' Do We Know Elegies? And I think it's a very beautiful piece of poetry. And this is a Stephen Spender um, translation. He says, um, he's asking, you know, why bother to live? You know, it's, it's so trivial. And so he says, because being here is much, because all this that's here, so fleeting, seems to require us and strangely concerns us, us, the most fleeting of all. Isn't that beautiful? And that seems to me, in a way it sums up my aesthetic, I suppose, it is, being here is much. I mean, it's trivial and it's comic and it's ridiculous and it's wicked and it's all those things, but it also is an extraordinary thing. I mean. You know, I do believe that, <laughs> that, that we're here by mistake because this is it's a beautiful, gentle world that's constantly looking away from us. I mean, you notice how trees are constantly looking away from us. They're saying, oh my God, those ants are down there again. <laughs> uh, again, when I was doing that gig with Richard Ford, <laughs> I, I said that our predicament is that we're, we're pirouetting on the way to the gallows. And uh, Richard at the end said, yeah, well, yeah, I, I view human life as very, we're ants in a fucking cupcake, you know, which I thought was wonderful, wonderful. And yet, and yet, what things we do. And ants, by the way, are remarkable creatures, remarkable creatures. So in comparison to ants, not necessarily bad. Yeah, but I'm, I'm still reading this, it cannot be all for nothing, uh, as suggesting more than that. Uh, well... There is no beyond for me. I mean, if, if you're believers in the audience, please forgive me, I don't mean to offend you. But for me, there is nothing beyond this. This world is heaven and this world is hell. Um, I've been extraordinarily fortunate to have lived in a time of relative peace and I think of my world as the old world, the world in which high art was still regarded as something to be aspired to. That's gone. That's that disappeared in the last five years. Um, in which being decent, in which uh, trying to do one's best to, to love one's loved ones and to be nice to one's friends and not too bad to one's enemies, trying not to make enemies. That world seems to me now to be as antique as Byzantium. 
Uh, it happened very quickly. And yet, I do feel, yeah, it's not, not all for nothing. Um, th this novel is set in the future. Airplanes have gone. Hmm? Airplanes have gone. Oh, yes, yeah, I, it's wonderful. Yeah, I've, I've destroyed the world. It's, it's, uh, the, the, the premise of it is that uh, uh, it's been, how would I put it? It's been discovered that the more we, more scientists, for instance, think about reality, the more reality decays. So we are destroying the world. So all uh, mathematics uh, professions have been dismissed. Some of them are in, are in prison uh, because they're dangerous. Uh, and it's, 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 a, it's a little fantasy of mine. But, uh, but the world is decaying. But I've, yes, I have got rid of cell phones and laptops. So they've all gone. Uh, anyway, and, and, and there are several uh, sort of almost casual references to the world wearing out to this novel appearing as a sort of a, as time itself comes to an end or as the world itself dissolves. Well, you see, I mean, the, 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 the <laughs> again, I mentioned my, 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 my much missed wife, she, <laughs> When I used to say, you know, I, I'm going to give this up, she'd say, oh, yeah. No, I would say, I, I can't do it because I can't get it right. She'd say, yeah, if you got it right, you'd give it up. If you wrote the perfect novel, then you wouldn't have to tr keep trying. He said, and then you'd go into politics and destroy the world. <laughs> uh, the ego, I mean, the, the artistic ego is a very, very dangerous thing, as we've seen. If you look at the 20th century, you know, Stalin, Hitler wanted to be a painter. I have a Jewish friend. She says, if only the, that Academy in Linz had given Hitler, had, hadn't refused him, they wouldn't have had the Second World War. Stalin wanted to be a poet. Pol Pot wanted to be a poet. Mao wanted to be a poet. All these failed artists, very, very dangerous people. Um, how do we get on to that? Um, we're talking about the end of the world, the sort of decline in the sense of yeah, yeah. things wearing out. <laughs> well, you see, yes, that's what I was going to say that I have to take the world with me when I go. Uh, in my detective novels, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to kill off all the people in it, you know, uh, so that they, there won't be any of them left when I'm gone. And in this, I try to destroy the world. <laughs> yes, the world itself. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I have a plan. I, I, I thought this would be my last book of that kind, but I'm going to write a short novel, a novella, called The Last Man. And uh, the world, like, human beings, they've, they've been, they're gone. Something, you know, avian flu or AI or something is destroyed. And there's only one man left. And he's delighted because he's, you know, he, he's finally achieved absolute solitude. He's always uh, uh, wanted. But then he discovers that there's a woman. There's a last woman as well. And they both know that they both exist, so they set out to kill each other, so that it won't. So the whole grotesque circles won't start over again. Uh, that could go wrong. <laughs> well, you see, I I suspect that the end of it will be a kind of an exhausted truce. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, who knows? It'll all start up again. Thank you very much, and um, thank you very much for the book. Thank you.